Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Grasp and Robotics series. As quick reminders, this and previously recorded talks can be found on our YouTube channel and website. Also, throughout the talk, please submit your questions using the Q&A button somewhere down on your, your Zoom panel. Um, these will be answered at the Q&A panel at the end of the talk. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our GRAS faculty host for today's talk, Dr. C.J. Taylor, Professor at the Computer and Information Science Department here at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much and enjoy the talk. Hey, good morning, GRASP. Uh, really nice, of course, uh, again, to be with you for another one of these talks. And uh, today it is our very great pleasure to have with us Professor Emmanuel Collins. Uh, Professor Collins is currently the Dean of the JB, School, the JB Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville. Uh, prior to that, he was the John H. Seeley Professor and Chair of the Mechanical Engineering Department at uh, Florida A&M uh, University. Uh, perhaps more importantly, he is a fantastic roboticist. Uh, so, uh, we had the great good fortune to be able to collaborate with um, a Professor Collins during the RCTA project. And it was always great to be able to go down to his lab and see the wonderful work they were doing with traction control for uh, uh, skid steer, steer robots and sort of taking really principled approaches to, to control um, and design. So it's always wonderful to see that. Um, Professor Collins has received a number of, of, of awards. Uh, I, I, we would be here a long time if I were to, if I were to cite all of them. I'll just uh, mention a few. He's a fellow of the uh, ASME, and he's also uh, received uh, NASA's honorary um, uh, accomplishment award uh, uh, um, uh, in his career. So again, we are very pleased to have um, uh, Professor Collins with us and very much looking forward to Okay, yeah, can I go? Yes, thanks. All right, let me share my screen. Give me a second here. Um, I think this, oh, here it is. All right, can you all see? Yes. Okay, just making sure. And I gotta move this out the way so I can put it in full screen. There is a delay when it starts. I think because it's a pretty big file, it, it uh, took a while to load when we practiced. Oh, there we go. Whoops. I'm sorry. It's starting at the bottom. I'm going to... So you can see all my slides. So um, you already know what I'm gonna say. All right. So I'm going to talk about trajectory planning and I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of uh, dynamic models and power models. And I'm going to uh, use a heuristic based approach. So think of A-star, A-star uses heuristics. First, let me tell you that at Louisville, we have the uh, LARI, which is Louisville Automation and Robotics Research Institute and these are just a sample of the kind of projects we have in uh, robotics at, at Louisville. Now I'm the Dean there, so I'm part of Larry, but I'm not particularly research active at this time. The center is, is not led by me, it's led by Dan Popa. So he's the founder and the director of Larry. And there are many faculty affiliated with this particular center. The work that I'm going to present um, was done while I was at both Florida A&M and Florida State. They have a joint college of engineering and there we had a center and it still exists, Center for Intelligence Systems Control and Robotics. So I wanna acknowledge that the work was done when I was there. Uh, the research was sponsored by these five agencies. Um, you're, you should be familiar with them. So I wanna give credit to the funding that we had for many, many years from these organizations. And these are some of my uh, students, postdocs that have contributed to this work. Um, I may not present all of their work, but I wanna give all of them acknowledgement and especially Damian Dunlap, who uh, really initiated this line of research during his PhD uh, uh, with me many, many years ago now. So we're gonna talk a lot about something called sampling-based model predictive optimization. Um, and we're gonna show, demonstrate that it works in planning 
for a wide variety of robotic uh, systems, manipulators, wheel vehicles, spacecraft, running robots, climbing robots. So the latter part of the presentation, I'm going to actually give examples. Some will be videos and some will be uh, just pictures because I don't want to take too much time. I want to keep this. So I'm assuming that in this um, particular audience, you're familiar with ASTAR, you're familiar with um, uh, trees and, and, and searching trees. So I'm not going to explain that concept. So all we're doing in, in a simplistic uh, form is some kind of a, a graph search, tree search. What's different about this research is that the nodes are time dependent. So um, K is the time indice. And at the, so it's really denotes K times some sample period T. Then at KT plus T, you have the blue nodes at KT plus um, uh, uh, two T, you have the green nodes, et cetera. So this graph is time dependent. And to generate the graph, you use inputs to some type of a dynamic model. And that will give you the next nodes because you feed these in inputs through the system and you get the next nodes and you repeat that. So it's graph search, but with a little twist. Um, and then how do you determine the cost of a node? It's just like you do in A-star. You have the cost from the start point to the current node plus the estimated cost to the goal. So this is just an A-star um, framework. And in practice, it does this type of a thing. So um, it's gonna take a little bit at the end here because it's trying to determine which way do I go? It looks like it wants to go that way. So this looks like a sampling based planner and that's what it is. And I'll let it go. Okay, so that's uh, a, uh, SBMPO uh, for a, a simple example. Most of these elements are present when you, when you talk about A star. What's different is in SBMPO, we have this propagation model and we have input sampling. So this is so these two are used to generate the 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 graph. So everything else here, and then ah, there is one difference too: heuristic calculations. How in the world do you do heuristic calculations in this type of a framework? So that's one of our primary contributions. Um, after we had started this line of research, we read Laval's planning book. I forgot the exact name of it, but it's pretty well known. And um, we saw that he had this concept. So what we did was, even though it wasn't originally motivated by uh, that book, we carried it to kind of a completion and we filled out the details of what does it take to do input sampling with a dynamic model and the need for heuristics within this framework. So this is what the, the model may look like. Um, it could be a nonlinear discrete time model, a state space model, but it doesn't have to be written in this form. It could be a neural network, could be a simulation, although simulations tend to be slow. It could be an input output model. So uh, you don't have states explicitly, you only have inputs and outputs that will mean something for you with a controlled background, or it could be something else that maybe I haven't thought about. Uh, in robotics, this model can represent the, the robot dynamics. And um, we're using sampling. I think this audience may know that you can either grid, grid is a, a special case of sampling, or you can do something like a halt in sampling. And the, the reason we do sampling as opposed to gridding uh, is because sampling allows you to go up in increments of one, whereas gridding uh, does not allow you to do that. You have to go up kind of exponentially. Okay, so um, 
what's not natural, to, at least it wasn't in the past, to people who have done planning is this concept of input uh, sampling. Uh, I want to say that my background is controls. So from controls, this is very natural to me. But when I got started doing planning and working with people who come more from the computer science world, it did not seem natural to them. So you'll see a lot of the planning literature, you're planning in what I would call this output space, or you may say the state space. Um, but why would you want to even um, use input sampling? Well, normally you just sample Y. That's traditional. If you see, if you introduce A star, you're sampling in the state space and that's natural. And, and that works for simple problems. If you have a flat floor, a mobile robot, um, you know, everything is, the, the, the surface is homogeneous, that, that actually can work quite well. But suppose you need to know what your inputs are. Um, if you need to know what your inputs are, this dynamic system may not be invertible. So um, that can be a problem for, for certain types of planning uh, uh, scenarios. If the number of inputs is less than the number of outputs, input sampling actually reduces the dimensionality of the problem. And um, even when the model is invertible, if you sample in the output space, and this is probably one of the biggest keys, you may get inputs to your system that simply are not achievable. It may ask, for example, if your inputs are acceleration, it may, uh, and you sample in the output space, you may require accelerations that are actually not achievable, or you may require force or torque inputs that the robot simply is unable to, to, to uh, obtain. So this is why we sample in the input space. But one of the criticisms of doing input space sampling is that in the output space, you may get nodes that are very close together. And that does happen. That is legitimate concern. So what we do in practice is we use implicit gridding to basically throw away nodes that are close to, to each other. So we only keep one. We don't keep both. And we use that quite a bit. Now, can you use this framework? Say you have software to do this for output sampling. Yes, if the model is invertible, then you can sample the outputs, you can determine the inputs, and then you can run SBMPO as if the inputs were sampled. This is a valid use of SBMPO, and we have used it at times. Uh, we don't often use it, though. We did not. Now, these are the key steps. This is really an A star type of algorithm. So um, your branch out factor determines the number of inputs um, to your system at any point as you are generating the, the graph. Um, and you, you have your nodes, uh, you sample the control space, uh, the number of times of the, uh, the branch out factor you generate your, your neighbors, um, you compute the heuristic, and you go back, two through five becomes a loop. And you repeat this until a stopping criteria is reached. So um, you could just say stop when I reach the goal, which is a suboptimal solution. Often we do that because we're worried about planning speed, but you could keep the system running until there are no possible nodes in the priority queue that can improve the cost. That's your normal A star stopping criteria. Um, you can use a prediction horizon and you wait till that prediction horizon. You're only gonna plan so many nodes out. So this, uh, you, you just wait till you plan so far out, um, but you may not have reached the goal. That's suboptimal. Um, and, and th then there are these other things. So you can pick your stopping criteria. One of them is optimal, but if you're worried about speed, you don't always use the optimal. And these are the type of cost functions that we, these are the cost functions that we have worked, worked with. Uh, minimum distance, minimum time, minimum energy, and then this minimum deviation. If you wanna 
use this framework in the context of model predictive control, which we have done, though I'm not presenting it here, you would use this particular cost function. So we explicitly think about cost functions when we do this work. If you read traditional planning literature, they don't always write down cost functions. Most of the time they don't. But to work in this framework is very good to write that down and know exactly what you're um, optimizing. And we use A star or LPA star so far, that's what we've used um, to, to do the, the actual graph search. Now, here's something interesting. The way you typically learn A star is a, a grid, you grid your space and you um, plan uh, from, to, from grid point to grid point. Can you do this standard grid based A star in SBMPO, which requires you to have a model? And the answer is yes, this little simple model with gridding uh, you as opposed to a halt and sampling you will give you standard A star. And I should mention that though we've only implemented with A star and LPA star, you can take another um, uh, uh, planning uh, optimization algorithm. And one, one would be, for example, MHA star, which should be used in this framework. And you can uh, integrate it with this framework. Okay, and um, I think I, I'm, LPA star and A star, I've kind of mentioned that, MHA star I've mentioned, um, the reason you want LPA stars, you can do more rapid uh, replanning as new uh, information on the environment is introduced. So um, that's why we implemented it with uh, LPA star. But why in the world do you even use A star, LPA star, MHA star? The reason is because if you can properly define heuristics, or sometimes they're called Go, co cost to goal functions, estimates of, of the cost from where you are to where to the goal, you can fairly dramatically speed up computation if these heuristics are uh, relatively non-conservative. And of course you want them to be optimistic, meaning lower bound estimates. Um, and a lot of you may be thinking, well, how about RRT or RRT star. And I'm not going to go much into this, but RRT was really like one of the first really popular sampling based planners. Um, and many of you know how that works. But the problem was it wasn't optimal. So people started to um, form uh, uh, or, or devise RRT star, and I'm sure there are many variants now of RRT star that actually does optimization within the RRT framework. We're doing something like RRT star. The main difference is that we are using heuristics or predictions to speed up computations. So our algorithm is not an RRT star that you would find in the literature. Ours is A star based and it does use heuristics. Now, it does come with some nice theory. So basically the theory says that if you are implementing SBMPO, it's going to find the minimal cost trajectory amongst the tree that is actually produced by SBMPO as it's in operation. It assumes that there's no implicit grid. Once you put the implicit grid, you can't really prove optimality, but you need the implicit grid in practice for most problems. Um, it's, it assumes that SBMPO has a sufficiently long prediction horizon. Think of it as infinity. Um, and you just run until you reach the goal. And then when it reaches the goal, you have to use the right stopping criteria, which was on a previous page, stopping criteria D. Okay. Now, this is the more interesting part, at least for me. How, what, how do you do heuristics when you have a dynamic model that's present? Well, um, I'm going to show you uh, some examples of how you can generate heuristics. 
And I'm going to do it for simple cases, but these simple cases can be used in more complex scenarios. So this would be a simple wheel that's rolling. And if you looked at the dynamics, you can see what's highlighted in red. It simply is a double integrator, x double dot equal a, where a is bounded below and above. So um, you can see that's gonna be related to mobile robots. If you look at manipulators, you can have this single link system. And when you do the dynamic model, you get the exact same structure, double integrator with, and you can put bounds on alpha below and above. So um, basically we can use those simple systems for mo more complex scenarios. In the more complex scenarios, you really don't have uh, constant lower and upper bounds. You have a time varying lower bound and a time varying upper bound. So by using the constant bounds, you're actually introducing conservatism. But to make the problem tractable, you need to do that. At least that's what we found with our limited knowledge. So suppose we're worried about time optimality. So we want to move this um, wheel from a start point to a goal point as fast as possible, but you can't accelerate uh, arbitrarily fast or decelerate arbitrarily fast. You have some bounds. Well, how do you get the heuristic that says, well, it's going to take me, I'm going to estimate how long it takes me to go from my current point to the goal. I mean, literally, how long? How, what's, what time does it take? That will be your heuristic. Well, you can go back to um, a, a optimal control theory based on the maximum principle. And a classic book, it's an old book, Bryson and Ho, um, will have a solution for you, although you have to generalize what they put in the book. So we first presented this in the paper shown at the bottom. And then you can maybe can find a better presentation in the paper shown here. But I'm just gonna give you the result. So Q10 at the bottom highlighted is your current position minus your goal position. Q20 is your current velocity. Then you, you look at whether or not this quantity is less than zero or if it's greater than zero, find out that. Then you have to solve a quadratic equation and the solution of the quadratic equation, or at least the positive solution of the quadratic equation is going to be your, uh, your heuristic. So that's how you do it for time optimal control. And basically for those of you with a control, with a control background, it's, that's, that heuristic corresponds to a bang bang control. So you're either all positive or, or you either at the upper bound on acceleration or the negative. And you have to figure out, it'll tell you uh, in, in, in this uh, theory where to do, uh, where to make the switch. However, this theory assumes continuously variable inputs, which you don't really have in practice. You're going to um, only change your inputs according to your sample period. So you don't have continuously variable inputs in a real system. Um, so the actual solution will not be bang, bang. Um, so, um, and of course, if you have time varying bounds, which you can't, then the, the, the actual solution is also not bang, bang. So this is a particular scenario you can see we have a start point, a star velocity. In, in both case, cases, they're zero. You have a goal, and you want to reach the goal at zero velocity. And then we use these other uh, criteria. So the main thing I want you to see is look at the acceleration plot. It looks almost like bang, bang. SBMPO produced this, but it's not really bang, bang. So it's close, but not exactly. And that's what we expected. Now you can also do distance optimality. You can set up the same problem. And sometimes you think, well, 
the distance optimality heuristic simply will be an estimate of, of the, or it could be exactly in this simple case, the distance to the goal. But we're trying to get to the goal at zero velocity. That's not a good heuristic. Your, your computations actually break down when you do that. And to see that, think that you can only decelerate so fast. So if your heuristic does not tell you, you can't get too close to the goal moving too fast. What's gonna happen is the system will run and it'll reach the goal, but it'll overshoot the goal. So you need something much beyond the simple, well, how close am I to the goal when, when you're dealing with a velocity constraint. And I'm not gonna go through the details, but this is actually the heuristic and it's based on simple physics. It's not that complicated, but you, you know, you, it will take you a while to think about why this is the case. And I don't have time to give the derivation. And when you take the same scenario, simple scenario and do your minimum distance, you um, end up with not as much a bang bang control, but something that's similar, a little bit bang, less bang bang than the previous uh, example. Then how about uh, energy optimality? Well, you could try to do this uh, energy optimality for this same scenario, but it's actually ill-posed because this system has no friction. So you can just think of a hockey puck moving on uh, ice, you can just push it to get it started and, and it'll get to the goal. And then you can just uh, slightly decelerate, pull on it to stop. You can use an arbitrarily small force to move from the uh, start point to the goal. So in this case, it's an ill-posed problem. You need to have friction in the problem is the point. So, um, we, we do put friction in the problem in the context of skid steer vehicles, and I will present results on that. So when you apply this in practice, you find out that you use a lot of different elements that you have to integrate together. Kinematic modeling, dynamic modeling, motor modeling, which is more kind of the electrical part of the motors that maybe drive your wheels, uh, control theory, um, motor control, and artificial intelligence. So when we uh, apply this in practice, we, um, we have to in integrate all these elements. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is momentum-based planning. And this is a case where if that particular vehicle, which had a human driver, did not accelerate enough or get enough velocity going into that hill, it would clearly not have made it up the hill. So robots also encounter these same issues. They encounter hills, they encounter uh, mud, um, they encounter thick vegetation. And in those cases, they need to uh, learn how to um, navigate those mobility challenges and you can't just do it with simple planning as you did before. So I'm going to show you results um, from my prior lab. And this is the case of vegetation. So this is a pioneer robot. Um, and we tried to get it to go through this uh, vegetation. It couldn't do it because there were torque limitations on the wheel. So all you're seeing here is that it doesn't get through uh, the 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 green. So now this is SBMPO, which now knows the dynamic model. And you can see that the planner says back up because you need to accelerate so that you have sufficient velocity going into this mobility challenge. And in this case, it traverses the green, this is position and reaches the goal. And then we did something with, with hill climbing. If you try to climb the hill, without sufficient velocity, can't make it up. So then we let S be, okay. So this just shows that you didn't get through the green. 
So we let SBMPO uh, use the dynamic model, including the hill model, and it knew that you needed sufficient velocity. So all that was done with the planner. Um, and you can see that it worked. So um, how did we make this work in practice? Because we wanted quick computations. We actually didn't directly use the dynamic model. We used a double integrator model. You can see it in our literature. Uh, we also used a computed torque controller um, uh, uh, for each wheel. And to enforce the torque constraints, we use the dynamic model indirectly. And in this case, the optimization was based on time optimality. So something similar is momentum-based lifting of heavy loads. So this is a Boston Dynamics video that some of you have seen. And you can see that they were using momentum to throw this heavy load. And uh, they don't really tell you how they did that, but I think they did optimization that was geared toward this particular scenario. So how can we use our framework to do something similar? Well, why is this important? We're just gonna show lifting, we're not gonna throw, but they're, they're virtually the same problem. Um, if you have a heavy enough load, just think of your, you're carrying a suitcase and you try to lift that heavy suit, it's a heavy suitcase, slowly onto the bed, you can't do it. You can't hold it at certain intermediate positions. Um, so how do you lift it on the bed? You have to swing it. Uh, you probably do it unconsciously. So um, you have these, so basically there are regions where you can only decelerate. So the only way to get through those uh, regions is if you have enough velocity going into them to get to uh, uh, the region that you're trying to get to. So this is a case where we have a double link manipulator and we told it to lift its arm uh, to this particular vi uh, position. So we told it um, the position we wanted for the two joints and it had no problem. So all we did was use a simple kinematic model to do the planning. Now we took that same plan, but we put a five pound load on and it simply could not do it. And it got stuck. Now we use SBMPO, but we told it the dynamic model and you could see that it was able to swing, use momentum to get the heavy load to the the position that we desire, very similar to what a weightlifter does, or you do when you lift uh, uh, your, your your heavy luggage. So the approach was very similar to what we did for the mobile robot. Uh, the optimization was based on time optimality. The difference was that the heuristic that we use was the maximum of the heuristic that we use for each degree of freedom. So we actually are computing a heuristic for each degree of freedom. And then we take the maximum of that within the SBMPO algorithm. Now, another thing we did, this is more later work with motion planning for climbing robots. And this work was done um, in conjunction with Jonathan Clark, whom some of you know, and uh, his former students, Max Austin, and Jason Brown. So um, as you know, uh, or some of you know, Jonathan Clark is, he, he focuses on design and control of these climbing robots. And he does walking robots and, and running robots as well. Um, but his specialty is climbing robots. And most of what you've seen in videos is just showing that the robot can climb. Uh, but how do you make the robot actually reach a goal where it has to avoid obstacles? And that's what we worked on. And so this shows, I think this is the same case. The obstacles aren't real obstacles, it's the tape. So you want to avoid the tape and you want to get to that blue dot. And now these robots can move laterally, but it's difficult. So you see it going up and down and up and down. All this is being done by planning. The, the cord there just keep keeping the thing from, if it falls off from, from breaking. 
So the planner, um, I can stop there. The planner uh, was, was actually gave you the desired trajectory, which is the, the black. Um, uh, so this is not an easy problem because for a long time, you couldn't really uh, control the lateral movement of these robots. But a few years ago, he figured out how to do that with, at least with his robots. And um, we did it with some other scenarios. I'm not going to show you the videos. I took them off for sake of time, but this one, was similar to the pr prior one. And this one, it had to move later, laterally. So you see it's fairly complex motion. This was done with planning. It's not just done by uh, teleoperation. So what was unique about this? Well, we had to get a model for these climbing robots. Uh, what we started to master when I was there was neural network modeling for these kind of dynamic systems. So the propagation model used within SBMPO in this case was a neural network model. Um, we used distance optimization. Uh, the distance-based heuristic um, was chosen so that the uh, computations could be fast. And we actually um, uh, introduced a stability penalty to help avoid um, uh, configure uh, maneuvers in which it was easy for the robot to fall, uh, fall off of the, uh, of, of the surface. So there are more details in the paper, but that was very interesting work. And prior to that, we did minimum time planning for autonomous spacecraft. And we were looking at scenarios in which your autonomous spacecraft has to go through a debris field and then has to rendezvous um, with another object and it has to rendezvous at zero velocity. Otherwise, if it doesn't, it could push that, there's no friction up in space. It could nudge that obstacle is trying to capture and, and, and set it in motion away from it. So it's a, it's a very momentum sensitive planning problem. So dynamic model is in order. In this case, we actually did propagate the dynamic model within SBMPO. And this is not an exciting video um, because it's hard to get inexpensive simulations of spacecraft we found. So we did something simple in MATLAB. But the uh, important point is that other approaches took 25 uh, or more seconds for this type of a scenario. And we were able to do the computations in less than one second, which is very important. Um, so I already mentioned we use the full dynamic model. Um, we use time optimality and similar to the manipulator problem, we use the maximum of the heuristic for each degree of freedom. And um, now energy efficient motion planning, we focused on skid steer vehicles, but the approach could apply to uh, any type of vehicle. Um, so we're optimizing the cost function here. Um, and we assume the vehicle can move in general cur curvilinear motion. And I, we did implement this in practice in, in, in a real robot, but it's kind of boring to watch it. So I'm just gonna show you the uh, sample results. And the main thing that we wanted to uh, show is if you worry about energy, you can decrease the energy consumption without increasing the distance traveled by too much. Now, why do the curves look like this? Well, when a skid steer vehicle um, turns, there is a lot of friction. And so the friction, of course, is burning energy. So when you put the uh, power model into the problem, you actually avoid making sharp turns. And so in both cases, you can see that it doesn't wanna make sharp turns, even though it can get there at uh, uh, maybe a little bit quicker or at a shorter distance. So this, again, showing you videos of this is kind of boring, but this gives you the big picture. So in, in this work, I should mention constant velocity was assumed. Um, uh, the, 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 the most difficult part was developing the power model. 
Um, it had to take into account the actuators, electrical models, and the wheel terrain interaction uh, 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 model. So this is the dynamic uh, model that was embedded in this power model. Um, the propagation model itself was essentially some type of a single integrator model, but the power model had the complexity. Um, and we did something like this for the llama robot. Um, our, this is only simulations. So uh, we had a, a very uh, fairly high fidelity, fidelity simulation of the llama model. Based on that high fidelity simulation, we were able to uh, get a neural network to mimic its dynamics and its and predict power. So this took quite a bit of work, and it it showed similar results to what we've seen with the skid steer vehicle that it wants to avoid sharp turns. So the red uh, trajectory is uh, what is the energy efficient, the blue is distance efficient. And in a simulation, you could achieve like a 32% uh, reduction in energy with only a 4% increase in distance travel. So results were very similar. Uh, what made this problem unique um, is the, the power model that was uh, developed using a, a feed, uh, feed for neural network. And something else, um, we had to kind of change the modeling paradigm to think in terms of strides, the completion of one set of cyclical leg motions. Otherwise, if you tried to do it in terms of time, it looked, there's a lot going on on each stride. So it, it looked like noise. And it's very, you know, when you're trying to train your neural network. So you theoretically could train your neural network in time but then it's gonna be a huge neural network and to show all that detail. So we have to think in terms of stride. So I'm gonna just to have a couple of slides on future research directions. Where would I take this research? Um, learning models is very important or adapting models. Um, if you're gonna operate in the real world, you need to have not, uh, you know, you can't be fragile. You can't have the system built upon one model, that model changes, uh, and then the system doesn't work. So um, we think that neural networks can be used for this adaptation. We've had evidence that they can be used, but we think that this use of neural networks is in its infancy. Um, you can improve efficiency of the neural network by taking advantage of some of these soft, software platforms. Um, but generally speaking, any research that leads to efficient learning of propagation models and adaptation of them in real time would be very valuable. And then the heuristics can also uh, be learned. Um, it's as the model becomes more complex um, or the cost function becomes more complex like the minimum deviation uh, cost function using model predictive control is, is difficult to work with analytically. So how do you develop heuristics in these scenarios? Well, you can learn them and we demonstrated this in a paper uh, we presented several years ago, um, but we considered this uh, preliminary work. We think that much more efficient methods can be developed. Um, Another thing that you can do, uh, I didn't present it here, but if you have terrains that are uh, undulating and have uh, multiple surfaces, so some of the surface is dirt, some of it is grass, some of it is maybe a concrete or asphalt, um, then planning is actually a, a difficult computationally. You need, a, because you really want to use multiple heuristics. So another way of kind of getting at the general problem of learning heuristics is to have a suite of heuristics and have a planning algorithm that can switch between these heuristics, which is kind of what, which is what MHA star does. So you can integrate SBMPO with this MHA star framework 
And um, it will help you with that problem. It will help you with the problem of uh, legged robots planning for them when they have different gates. The different gates require also different heuristics. So I'm going to stop there. And I think um, we're going to take questions in another platform. Oh, uh, hi there. So um, thank you very much, Emmanuel. It's really, it's really wonderful to, to, you know, uh, to get a chance to sort of see the see all of the aspects of that and, and, and how that how that played out in so many different contexts. Um, so uh, let me actually introduce uh, two other panelists, uh, Hirsch Shangvi and Fernando Cladera. They are uh, two graduate students here at the University of, uh, of uh, Pennsylvania uh, in, in the Grass Lab. Um, and uh, what we're going to be doing here is actually uh, we're going to be doing the Q&A uh, in, um, uh, in Zoom. Uh, and then after that, we'll be going to gather town for a sort of more informal gathering for those of you interested in, in, in talking further with the speaker. Um, but uh, please uh, feel free to uh, post questions in the Q&A uh, and we will uh, address them to, to the speaker. But while you're doing that, we're going to take advantage of, uh, of our panelist position and uh, use it to, to uh, uh, um, uh, at, Ask uh, some questions of Emmanuel. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go first I can, uh, uh, because it was a, it was a really wonderful wonderful talk. And there was a uh, there was something a couple of things I was I was curious about. One was the um, the uh, first off is I was wondering in if you if you have sort of guidance in good ways to dot design sampling strategies in this input space because. Uh, you know, as robots get more and more complicated, let's say we're talking about a quad. Well, I guess quad is in some sense. We have, uh, uh, we could either think of it in terms of sampling, you know, the raw thrust to the, throat, to the rotors or in terms of, you know, changes in, changes in pitch and orientation, uh, orientation and, and, and overall thrust. So you might have sort of different dimensions in your input space that actually mean and do different things. Um, and I was wondering if you sort of came across stuff in, in, in looking at the, at the variety of systems that you that you've worked with that gave you, uh, you, know, you know, suggested sort of good or bad ways of, of sampling. Yeah, I think you mean what what do you physically sample as opposed to how do you sample like how, what's your branch out factor? You mean how do you how do you physically sample? Yeah, I'm envisioning a situation where your input space, as you is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, could be heterogeneous. You could have different control inputs that that do sort of different things. Um, well, you, yeah, you're always trying to simplify the problem. So I tell you, when we got started working with the legged robots, things were more complex. So, but sometimes it was kind of obvious, you know, you. you Ultimately, you have a control system that, that has knobs. And so you really look at what that control system is and what knobs it has, those knobs are going to be what you sample. So it's in some way, it's not that difficult. Now, you may try to say, well, if you have too many knobs, then you may say, but really you don't need to use all these knobs at the same time independently. I, you know, so you might say, well, look, if we, if we turn knob A, we always turn knob B. And so that becomes, well, I'll just tie knob B to knob A. And so now you have only one input there instead of two. So that would be the kind of way you would look at the problem. But each problem is going to be a little bit different. So I'm not giving you a, a hard, fast rule, but that's how we would approach it. Uh, so, uh, Hirsch or Fernando, right? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm gonna uh, start with one question. So, first of all, thank you for uh, the talk. Um, and I would like to remember everybody that if you have any questions, you may type them uh, in the Q&A section, uh, that is uh, in Zoom. Um, so, first of all, I see that your system, uh, you need some kind of modeling uh, of, of your physical system. And my question is oriented to how does your um, algorithms behave when the parameters of the system are mo not modeled correctly or when these parameters are changing during time? Um, 
what are the results or are there any ways of avoiding problems with this kind of issues? Oh, um, your model doesn't have to be totally accurate. It never is totally accurate, uh, but it needs to be, it can't be, that's, if, if the model is too far off, you're gonna get bad results. So that's why at the end, I talked about adapting the model and we did show that we can, I didn't show, I didn't show you all my results here. That, that would take too long, but you can adapt the model. So that's why I talked about in um, real world operations, you want to, uh, the, you want to be non-fragile. So you want to adapt the model as you go along. And sometimes that may be, uh, that may require you to put, put the, to adapt the model, you may want to put have a training um, trajectory that you put it through that says, hey, I need to kind of stimulate all my dynamics to see what I look like right now. For example, if you went through, uh, say if you put another load on the on the on the robot, you put a you or you you change the load. You could even take the load off or you can put the load on. The dynamics can change fairly significantly. So you may have a diagnostic trajectory that says, hey, I think things have changed. Let me take the time if I can to, uh, to do that. If, if you know that your model is not that accurate, then what I would do is um, be, have conservative movements. So you wouldn't be as ambitious in your movements. And that's all I can say there for now. Thank you. No, that's that's a very good, uh, very good answer. Okay. Thanks for the great talk. <clears throat> I have a question that's sort of the converse of CJ's. So he was asking about uh, sort of parameterizing the input space. Um, have you looked into uh, the branching factor and plotting sort of how your model performs as you increase or decrease the branching factor and sort of how many samples is enough? to get good performance. Yeah, that you do experimentally. Um, the, in general, you would think that the fewer computation, uh, the, the smaller the branch out factor, the faster the computation, the larger, the slower, but it's not monotonic. So you have to experimentally find what kind of is the sweet spot for your branch out factor. So your, if your branch out factor is too small, uh, first of all, you're, you're, you're too coarse. You know, your, your, your tree is not rich enough. So it has to be rich enough um, to, to actually kind of get close to the goal or, or, or within the vicinity of the goal. But if you make it too big, it definitely slows things down. But it's not monotonic in terms of computation. And there is no, th you know, this would be a good topic. Can you f find a way to find out the branch, branch out factor, uh, uh, you know, without just doing a whole bunch of experiments and maybe automate that? Th those are good questions. So, uh, Emmanuel, I want to pick up on, on, on something you said really at the end, which I really, really resonated with, which is the, the, the uh, idea of, um, using network, you know, seeing if we can adapt kind of modern neural networks to, um, uh, to learn models on the fly. In some sense, it sort of, you know, it, it is, you know, it, it harkens back to kind of, you know, adaptive control and sort of other things that we have mm -hmm. really wonderful understandings of, or, whereas neural networks in some sense head in, head in the opposite direction. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's really, it, it's, it's really, you know, seems like a very key point in that, um, where the, the challenge of course is, is uh, that our, our current learning paradigms are tend to be re relatively slow, where what we want in some sense robotic applications is things that figure out, you know, there's an extra five kilograms on my, on my, on my flying platform or my legged uh, or, or my actuator is not working well today. So yeah. I, <clears throat> I was just <clears throat> curious about whether you had any thoughts about uh, you know, how we, how this kind of adaption, we could make these things adaptive um, and reactive, sort of the, that they're, that they're, that they're, they can happen on the kind of scale that, that, that I think you're pointing to. Well, you can tell when your, your model's not working because in, within SBMPO is a model. That model 
to say it's a neural network model that you, that, but not necessarily always adapting, but it's, it's and you, you see this, it, and so it's predicting the behavior when the, pre, when the behavior deviates significantly from the, the model predictions, you know something's wrong or something is, there's a mismatch. At that point, um, you could, like I say, put it through a diagnostic trajectory um, or the alternative is just continually adapt the model, which is computationally more expensive to, you know, you have to keep that thing continually adapting. Um, kind of like you do in traditional adaptive control, but traditional adaptive control typically is looking at linear models. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I don't no, think I, it did. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it did. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that, yeah, you, you raise a good point that in some sense, uh, figuring out that your model is wrong is, is can be done relatively quickly. And, yep. and the question becomes, how do you, how do you fix it? And what, uh, again, just sort of, sort of throwing stuff, I'm wondering whether it is possible to sort of learn what the manifold of deviations might look like for a particular class of, for a particular robot or classes to sort of make this make this faster, but that's that's pure speculation. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing you would look at in research. You're asking questions that I would ask. If I were still <laughs> active, I would be asking those particular questions. But, but, but you're raising the right questions. So this is the great, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's where it all starts. Um, I, I have one more while, I'm, while, while, while I have the floor. Uh, as you mentioned this, this uh, implicit gridding technique, to sort of manage the complexity on the output side and uh, when things get close, uh, get, get close together. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, I'm curious in that one of the great things about this technique, as you said, is that it, it allows you to some sense um, explore the entire dynamic state of the vehicle. So like those, you know, cars go that need, or the, the vehicles that need to go across to preserve uh, energy, uh, you're taking into account, into account not just position but velocity and acceleration and all of the the, the things to which to which it's air. Uh, I'm thinking about that in the context of implicit gridding and saying that now we have an output state space that has all of these different uh, again um, uh, uh, dimensions to it. You have position as a dimension. You have uh, velocities as a dimension. You might have accelerations as dimensions. Um, and it seems like what you're pointing to is, is that there's a way that there's a metric effectively on that space to decide when two states are close. Um, That's um, and yeah, in, a, in situations like that, where you're combining sort of different aspects of the state space that you know, measure differently, mean different things, uh, it is, are there good ways or bad ways to, to do that that, uh, that you found? And well, that that's the art but it is true if you're typically we were looking at uh position a position and and velocity i mean it might be three positions and three velocities and you definitely don't use the same i mean they don't they don't even have the same units right. so in, inherently the implicit grid uh can't be the same for position and and velocity because they don't even have the same units so you do want to grid them. I mean, there's they're one, they're part of the same grid, but you, you they're different and you have to play with it to see what works. So you really are playing with it in simulation. And my students did that. We don't, you all are getting to the art of things, which is really how we make things work. So you have this nice tool, but to make it work in practice, you have to do tuning. And the tuning is not always based on some rigorous theory. Now, I'm probably, I'm the only one that does stuff that way in robotics. The rest <laughs> of you have some rigorous theory that does <laughs> everything for you. But well, yes, we had to, we had to uh, manually tune the, the, to find out what works the best. The purpose of the implicit grid is to keep the priority queue from getting too, too large so that the computations are, are fast. So you just play with it till you get the desired speed up, yeah. but don't get a significant degradation in performance. Yeah, yeah. no, we, 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 you know, we, we absolutely, you know, <laughs> working with real robots, is, it, it's all about it. But in some sense, that's, it, it, that's the fun thing of having you here because we get to, we get to, 
you know, uh, un uh, uh, understand part of the secret sauce that yeah. actually, and those are more sort of the interesting idea, for some, in some sense, some of the uh, most interesting aspects of, uh, of looking at this. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, we, we, yeah, we appreciate it. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned that you were sort of using kind of uh, maxes over distances in some, in some of the work. I'm wondering if that was you know, kind of a, uh, uh, a, yeah, you found that sort of to be, the, you know, a good way um, to go, but perhaps I mis misunderstood you. Were... Uh, it, we're using what over, you mean minimizing distance? Yes, and uh, some of the, you're using the, using uh, 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 maxes over uh, some of the dimensions. So computing distances in different dimensions and then using a max. Oh, that was for the heuristic. Yes. So, so the heuristic is a lower bound. We were taking the maximum of the lower bounds for the different degrees of freedom. Excellent. Okay. You were okay. always minimizing the cost function, overall cost function, we're always minimizing time, distance, energy. But the heuristic, you know, I didn't present the details because that gets, I, I mean, if you give me a, you know, two hour seminar, I would. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not. I don't want to do a two-hour seminar, but if you did, I, 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 I would present those details, and it would be more understandable. No, oh, it's uh, no. We, we definitely, definitely appreciate. I, I, we did have a, a question from uh, an audience mem member, uh, Harsh, uh, who was asking about the case of the robot was just passing through inclined, inclined terrain, and uh, does it? Is a robot have the ability to differentiate between normal terrain and inclined terrain using a sensor, like a camera, or something like that? Oh, the question from one. Yeah, of the our question audience. is basically, how do you get an elevation map? Um, now we didn't explicitly deal with that, but we thought a lot about it. So um, sometimes elevation maps are available for particular, you know, especially the large for large regions. Like they'll show mountains, for example. But okay, if you're talking about smaller regions, the elevation map may not exist, which we thought about doing. And we probably had in a proposal that didn't get funded or we never submitted because I became a dean. We would use we would use something like quadrotors to to, you know, in conjunction with the ground vehicle, you could put a quadrotor and it could it could tell you the elevation map. That's how we thought we would do it. And we know we can do that for sure. And that is a good question. Like GPS to know where you are on that terrain map. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I have another question. So one of the key components uh, of SMBPO is um, the heuristic because it's a A star based planner. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, for this heuristic, uh, you, you did some. Um, experiments for the different systems you show, but uh, you say that we can learn this heuristic. Uh, of course, being a heuristic, it has to be optimistic and it doesn't have to be pessimistic. So um, how would you like uh, differentiate this, this kind of situations uh, when your system is running? Oh, that's a very insightful question. In truth, okay, now I'm gonna confess. When we did the learning of the heuristic, the analytical stuff I presented, you get an optimistic heuristic. When you learn a heuristic, it's not optimistic. I don't know how to do it. So what I said, what I say is you may have situations where you have to learn a heuristic. It's not optimistic. Now your planner can work on an, a non-optimistic heuristic. It just, you can't guarantee optimality. I mean, and it'll still, but it can still give you a good result. But what I say is that you may want to look at A star algorithms for how much suboptimality you get, depending upon how uh, non optimistic or pessimistic the heuristic is. I don't know that you can develop a, a learning method for heuristics that leads to an optimistic heuristic. If you can, it's a really great result. But I never figured out how to do it. That would be a great. But I say, well, why don't we just look at the theory and say, um, you know, how how bad does does it, you know, how non-optimistic do do my plans get when the heuristic is not optimistic? That's a very very insightful question. 
Thank you. Got another question. So you, you mentioned a little bit <clears throat> in the talk that you have this trade-off between sampling in the input space versus the output space. Um, and in my mind, so if you have a scenario where your sort of terrain is really cluttered with obstacles, you would want to sample in the output space because a lot of the inputs you apply will re probably result in collisions. Uh, so have you explored at all learning or any sort of generation of inverse models uh, for output sampling? I'm going to disagree with your intuition. Can I, can I ask your background? What's your background uh, in terms of, are you engineer or computer scientist or what? Uh, yeah, I did uh, electrical engineering in undergrad and now I would say I'm more of a computer science person. Okay, yeah, I get this all the time for computer science. By the way, a lot of our scenarios were cluttered environments. That's how I started all this. I start, no, it, it, it works for cluttered environments. I, I'm, not, I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm saying your, your intuition, I can understand it, but it doesn't bear out in practice. So we, we did many cluttered scenario environments where you use input sampling and input sampling def, d does work in those environments. Um, but to be honest with you, I didn't even think sampling would work. Realize I come from traditional controls and sampling is really discretizing your world that's a really a continuous world. It was counterintuitive to me that you could do that kind of sampling and still get good results. I, until I saw Tony Stintz doing it over and over again in presentations with the first CTA. And uh, so that was counterintuitive. And yes, I understand your intuition, but I will tell you input sampling works in, in um, those scenarios. And I think Gabriella is telling you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Well, uh, if I could just get a quick moment, I just wanted to thank Emmanuel again for some sort of wonderful talk. I mean, it's, it's really thought provoking and it's just wonderful to sort of see the breadth of, uh, of effort in there and, and get to sort of hear you uh, talk about it at greater length. So ho hopefully we'll have a, a chance to sort of speak, speak more on this. So uh, um, wonderful. So with that, I'll turn, turn it back over to Gabby. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for our Gasma Robotics talk. Please tune in next Friday, uh, February 26 at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Bell from Johns Hopkins University. For more information on this and upcoming events, be sure to follow us on social media or check out our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful weekend.